introduce yourself. Uh, yes, hello, I'm Caroline Charles from Ravensbury Ward. Hello, I'm James Willis-Croft from Lower Morden Ward. Um, Kirsten Galia on the ward. Oh. Councillor Matthew Willis, Rains Park. Daniel Holden, Hillside. Tara will take over with the first, with her presentation of everything, I'll give you a rough brief of how this committee works and what we do. And uh, Tara is quite happy for you to ask a question through the presentation, uh, whenever you feel one is necessary, okay? And I think that's it for me. Thank you, councillors. Uh, for, I thank everybody um, we've met before, but my name is Tara Butler. I work in the Future American team, and I'm usually the lead officer for the Borough Plan Advisory Committee. So welcome to the Borough Plan Advisory Committee. This is the first meeting of this uh, cycle. Unfortunately, the last meeting was scheduled on the day that the Queen's death was announced. So this, the items from that meeting have been moved into this meeting now. There are just three uh, items on the agenda tonight. Uh, Dennis asked me to do a brief overview of what the Borough Plan Advisory Committee is. And then we have two other items, one to update you on the local plan and the other to update you on a consultation that started today about houses in multiple occupation. And I'm just going to let you know that a colleague from Democracy Services is going to come downstairs soon. And I think there's a couple of cameras that are cutting us off at the top of our heads. So he's just going to come down and adjust those cameras for us. Okay, so the first item on the agenda is uh, just in your papers, you will see the council's constitution as to what the Borough Plan Advisory Committee does. And as it's our first meeting, Councillor Pierce has asked me to just brief you on this. It's fairly straightforward. It advises the decision makers, which is usually cabinet or council, on planning policy matters. It could be the local plan. It could be planning guidance. It could be um, environmental assessments or neighbourhood plans. This isn't a decision-making body, it's a, it is an advisory body. So if we have recommendations, those recommendations will go on to cabinets or council, depending on what we were advising on. Chair, could I ask anyone if anyone's got any questions on that? Yes, one quick question. Um, is any knowledge of planning policy and planning law required as a prerequisite like it is on the planning committee? It's not quite the same as planning committee because planning committee is fulfilling a statutory function and taking decisions on behalf of the council as the local planning authority. So as we go through items on which you're advising decision makers, then if there is any issue that isn't clear from the reports or isn't understood, we can talk through it so everyone's aware of what they need to do. But unlike planning committee, there isn't specific training for the Borough Planning Advisory Committee because it's not a decision-making body. And hopefully after the next three meetings, uh, everybody will have picked up enough knowledge um, to be able to progress. Uh, yeah, so I sort of get that because obviously we're not voting on things like we do in planning and a couple of people here are on planning as well. But um, I, I suppose my question in regards to what you just said is about like if we're not, um, if we're an advisory body, um, do do they need the advice? Because, for instance, uh, agenda item five today is the same as agenda item five in September in, in, in theme in the HMOs, but obviously it was going to, we were going to advise on the cons on the consultation and giving the um, the cabinet member or for the environment, the, the, the director of the environment, the ability to do it. Now it's done. Um, I sort of wonder, 
um, who fulfilled that function instead of us if that's been skipped and today um, we're just at the position where Article 4 is being introduced as we speak. Thank you, Councillor. Um, if you like, the agenda item five about the Article 4s uh, will be coming back to this committee when Cabinet are making a decision on it which will probably, and council in fact, which will probably be next March, April. So this, if you like, is a forerunner uh, for that before March, April, and to let you know about the consultation that started now, but we can talk about that under the agenda item. As I say, I've been on this quite often, but some of the things we are going through have started two years ago, maybe longer and they will go on two years after this meeting. They don't get they don't get done in a council year. Very few, do they? Most of them go overlap, either before or after or both. So the decision are um, probably, if you're not here next year, someone else will be making that decision for you. <laughs> Two councillors, have any other questions? Right. Chair, shall we move on to the second agenda yes. item? Right. Thank you. The next item is to update councillors on the local plan. There's a report here, and what I'm going to do is summarise some key points from the contents of the report. Firstly, and probably the most important point, is that we are at the end stage of the Council's local plan. It was started in 2017, and this is the final point we're at. And therefore, the role of this committee um, is more to make a decision, uh, well, to advise Cabinet and Council in the next committee cycle about the adoption of the plan or not. So I'll just summarise what's been happening in the past four years, five years. Um, work started in 2017, and what councils have to do when they want to revise their planning policies is they have to find evidence for what they want to do. They have to make sure they're in line with national policy and the London plan, and they have to consult residents about what they want to do. And we did extensive consultation on this local plan, more than nine months across that time. We did quite a lot of, um, I suppose, joint consultation with other projects, because much and all as I like planning, it can be incredibly dull and incredibly long for people. So uh, when we go out and we're talking about a transport project, such as um, there was a tram proposal a few years ago, when we're standing at Morden uh, Station on a Saturday, uh, we can talk about the local plan or people's concerns or um, uh, desires about housing and things like that in conjunction with the transport project or the environmental project. So there was a substantial amount of consultation that took place and if anyone's interested there's a, quite a big document online that sets it all out. Last July, July 2021, um, after the plan was drafted, the Council took the decision to send that to the Secretary of State and for the last year the Secretary of State appointed two independent planning inspectors. If you like, they're it's a kind of quasi-judicial, so they are the, the judges, if you like, of the Council's local plan. And uh, I know councillors here attended some of the hearing sessions. There were five weeks of hearing sessions, some in June of this year and some just going in October. And the, the inspectors looked at the policies in the plan, they looked at the sites, they looked at the land designations, and they listened to people who came, who wanted the plan changed, and they listened to the council's view. And the report links to where the information is online, because absolutely key to this is that everything has to be transparent and available publicly. So if the inspectors ask anybody, the council or a community group to write something about a site they care about, then that is put on the council's website for everyone to see. So people can see the exchanges of information. 
And that legal process has been going since last December. We are now at the final stages. The next stage is for council officers to take away all the many actions that came out of those five weeks of hearings and make sure we do them. So, for example, the inspectors have asked us to make some changes to some policies where they believe they're not in line with national policy. They've asked us to make some maps a bit clearer where they believe that the map is all right, but it could be clearer for people to see. They've asked us to make sure the plan is formatted correctly. And, and they've asked us to look again at some housing delivery and site allocations. And we will do these actions. And then it will be for the inspectors to say if they're correct or not. And if the inspectors have asked for another six weeks of public consultation to take place on this final stage. So that is likely to take place if I was a betting person, I'd say it was probably from January onwards. It will be for the inspectors to say to the council when, but most people don't like to consult over the Christmas period. Councillor Withers? Uh, just because it's relevant to that, obviously they've said it needs to come back. Um, because there's currently two versions of the local plan published on, on the website, uh, I think stage two and stage three, um, it, would this uh, local plan committee uh, have sight of what's going to be published next before it goes online? It will be, yes, yes, we will send it to councillors. At this stage, I would say it's not the council as an entity that would have can be advising on it. So I will definitely send the version to councillors, but it will be for the inspectors to say, yes, we're happy with that. We believe it represents what these people said at the hearing or this, uh, this community group wanted done or in line with national policy. We're past the stage, if you like, where officers or councillors are advising on what direction the policy should take, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. And um, follow up to that, um, there was a mention last night at full council of, of by one of the councillors for alterations to the local plan and all the southwest um, London plan for the waste policies. Um, Based on what you just said, is that now too late for those sorts of changes to happen? And should they be requested much sooner? In a nutshell, yes. The South London Waste Plan was adopted at last month's full council, subject to the inspector's reports being confirmed. And this local plan has been sent to the Secretary of State last year. And once it's with the Secretary of State, it is the Secretary of State that guides what happens next rather than us as, as a council. Um, the council is still involved at the end in the uh, adoption or rejection of what the Secretary of State says. There are councils who have not chosen to take forward their local plan. It uh, isn't within our gift to take parts and not other parts. It's an all or nothing scenario. Um, and that would be a decision that we would need to consider spring of next year, according to the inspectors, which is when they consider that the six week consultation will be over, that they, the inspectors, will have considered all the feedback from the consultation and that they will hopefully give us a positive report to say that the plan should go ahead. If they ask for the plan to be significantly changed or paused while other work goes on, obviously that decision will not take place or be deferred. Um, just because it sort of relates, uh, so in paragraph 2.6, it says um, that those seeking changes must demonstrate why the plan, plan's unsound. Um, and so in regards to sort of me wanting to look at it before it goes online, essentially, as a borough plan committee member, is just for those little tweaks, it's not to change direction or anything. It would be, for instance, um, you said some maps are going to change. So as an example, a cursory look at the Rains Park policies map puts Wimbledon Chase Station in Wimbledon, shaded green when the document refers to it in the body as Rains Park several times, such as on page 220. So little things like that, I'd love to be corrected before they went out. Thank you, Councillor. That's exactly one of the actions from the hearings as well, to make sure that there's consistency in those particular issues, to make sure that Wimbledon Chase is clearly marked, not in green for Wimbledon, but in, I think, orange for Rains Park. Um, and you've kindly sent through um, some of similar kinds of um, changes as well, which we'll definitely be, we have been looking at so far. 
So if you like, this committee is at the end, as I said, at the end stage of the local plan. So should the inspectors uh, give a positive report in the spring and should the plan move forward to adoption, probably the next phase for the committee would be to look at planning guidance. The guidance might be on specific sites or it might be on a particular policy issue. Um, there's a lot of information about the local plan. It's pretty overwhelming at this stage when it's been five years worth of work and lots and lots of consultation responses. So either inside or outside this meeting, if anyone has any queries about a particular policy or a particular site, please don't hesitate to contact me. I'm more than happy to support you in it. Does anyone have any further questions? This is probably a silly question, but seeing as I'm new to all of this. Um, so you're saying about, about certain sites, but I mean, what if something crops up that isn't in the plan and it's a brand new kind of site? Would that, what, what happens in that case? Most sites come forward outside the designations in the local plan. The local plan sets out planning policies at which the planning committee or officers, if it's delegated, to make decisions on development. There are some big sites in the local plan, but as, as many councillors on planning committee will know, most of the sites you see are fairly small and will just continue to come forward over the coming years without being specifically identified. A site doesn't need to be identified in a local plan to get it to come forward. But it's useful if it is for a few reasons. First of all, it tells residents and others uh, that this site will come to planning at some stage. It gives people advance warning. It gives the infrastructure providers advance warning. Thames Water, the AHS, our own council school places team, that especially for new homes, that new homes will be built in a certain place. And it allows us to assess if there is capacity for GPs, for school places, for the water supply, for electricity supply in that area. So it is useful to have sites in a local plan for those reasons, but it doesn't mean that every site has to be there. I hope that helps. Um, yeah, a couple of questions. Uh, so there's quite a few dated uh, reports now, um, strategies, things like the coal plan strategy 2011, um, sites and policies plan 2014 which I vaguely remember having a vote on them as a, a new council back then without having much knowledge because it, it, that spent a few years being prepared but at what point do those sorts of ones drop off and this new one that's now going through its final stage become um, become sort of the, the prime document as it were thank you councillor yes should full council adopt a new local plan next spring, should we get a positive result from the inspector's report, then that plan will be the planning document where planning committee will make those decisions. The core plan strategy 2011 will disappear. Uh, the sites and policies plan 2014 will also disappear. The council will be left with three plans, the new local plan, the estates plan, which is dated 2018, which is only for the three Clarion Estates and the South London Waste Plan that was adopted last night at Full Council, which is pretty niche because it's only for planning applications for waste management. The Estates Local Plan uh, 2018, which is just for those three Clarion Estates at High Path, Ravensbury and Eastfields, and the waste plan is just for waste management, so we, we don't get too many applications like that. Okay, and the other one is, given the number of years it's taken to develop this plan, um, and given it's subservient to the Mayor's plan and the MPPF, what happens if one of those things changes in the interim? Would, would that alter the time frame of our local plan? Not really. Um, what happens if national or low regional policy changes between now and next spring is that the inspectors will write to the council concerns and they will say, this has changed. Can you look at your plan and make sure that it aligns or tell us what you're going to do to align those two particular issues? 
that has happened to us before with previous plans and it is possible to navigate that because governments rarely says something that isn't expected to come down the track. We usually have forewarning, consultation on changes to national policy. Um, usually the most recently adopted policy applies. Governments are proposing to change that to say that regardless of when it was adopted, national policy will take precedence in all circumstances. That change hasn't quite been brought in yet, but it may well be introduced. Um, forgive me, I'm going to mention one particular site, um, and it's just because it's come up a couple of times locally. Um, obviously, I'm a Rains Park Ward councillor, um, but in uh, 1.3 of the agenda, it says that Merton's policies maps being revised at the same time, um, and that will replace 2014 policy map. Um, so there's a couple of changes between them, and it says the council has reviewed uh, these changes, and I'm just wondering... Um, specifically about one site which is by 111 Coombe Lane uh, which is a section uh, where the old Wimbledonian uh, football ground is so I mean you can bring it up in the um, it's number two of the green uh, maps there uh, basically the path to Coombe Lane is metropolitan open land in the existing policy map but that is removed in the new policy map, which would enable some development on that's been rejected previously because it's metropolitan open land. Um, and if you're a hedgehog, that wouldn't be the thing. So just wondering uh, basically who, who reviewed it if it says the council has reviewed it. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. That's a good question because it actually applies to sites right across the borough. And we have to look at metropolitan open lands and all boundaries when we review a local plan. It is the time that those are meant to be reviewed rather than through planning decisions. So part of the review was to employ consultants to do a green infrastructure study, which we did in 2020. And part of the consultants work was to go out and look at sites right across the um, borough. And they made recommendations about metropolitan open land, some to keep it the same, some boundary changes. In some afterwards, we followed up with some extra reviews of our own because it was sometimes uh, the case that people had written in to say, actually, uh, you know, this has happened since your consultants did the work, or this is how this particular area functions, or we don't agree with what the consultant said. Um, in fact, the inspectors went to a site in Collier's Wood to look at metropolitan open land boundary for in, in, a, in a case like that. Um, I can't, I'm pretty sure I know where you mean. It's a path between Coombe Lane and the uh, field. Yes, yeah. so at the, it's the Somerset and Camberley roads join with a footpath and there's a large tree canopy that runs along. And so at the moment, the driveway into the rugby pitches will be retained as metropolitan open land, but not the footway and cycleway in. And we've had uh, quite a lot of discussions locally about disabled access down that path as well. Um, but it's just, it's come up so many times recently that I've been, oh, it, obviously it, it's probably too late as we've discussed, but is that something that this committee would have been able to, for example, um, recommend on at that time would that have been a role for the committee and then just now because it's it's too late to do so but that would have been something that we could have done yes that those kind of issues are what uh, the committee can advise the decision maker cabinet or council depends on the proportion on i will look into that particular site just to triple check that's um whether the multiple urban land boundaries have changed because that's it's quite a small sliver and forgive me i can't remember uh, off the top of my head, but I will get back to councillor with that. Another silly question, question but um, uh, with the um, South West uh, London Waste Partnership business, so yeah, it was adopted at council last night. So does that mean basically that's it now for moving forward because because obviously there, there's been some misgivings about it with the general public and even maybe some of the councillors so I'm wondering is that something now we we're going to have to live with for, for quite a long time yes the council prepared a waste plan back in 2012 and I will emphasize because it is really confusing that this is very different from the waste partnership so it's not about collecting our back 
black bags. It's not about working with Veolia or otherwise. It is simply a planning document that should Merton or any of the other boroughs receive a planning application from someone for waste, that's the policies that are used to decide it. And we need to, legally, we have to review plans every five years. And it's something that councils want to do anyway, because otherwise you end up making planning decisions on information that could be out of date, especially things like environmental protection, which has moved on in the 10 years since we did the first plan. So the, the South London Waste Plan went through consultation and it was considered by all four councils. And we had hearings with an inspector in this chamber last September 2021. And the two inspectors considered any objections and things like that. And the four councils now are adopting the plan. Um, it will only be used should someone apply for waste management um, decisions in Merton. But that plan is now in place for another 10, at least 10 years. We will have to review it within five years um, because we don't want to be without a plan that allows us to make decisions on waste in case you know something has happened. I have one last thing, um, which is, I mean, to begin with, just to thank you and the team for being so um, communicative and uh, working so hard because, you know, we've all read the packages and there's so much work has gone into it. It's brilliant. Um, reflecting what the chair said, though, obviously it's been going since 2017 and you've just said as well, it will need to be reviewed. So I'm wondering if um, things in the plan uh, could be more up to date before they're published. So for instance, uh, on page 344 of the plan specifically uh, it's like it, it says over the last 10 years to 2017 and so I just sort of feel like if something like that's coming out in 2023 and it still says it's over the last 10 years to 2017 it's sort of it's published as an out-of-date document um, even for instance some of the sites so RP1 in Rains Park is now an open Fenny's nursery for instance and so all of the suggestions in there are, are, are now moot. So I'm just wondering if those changes will be made or if it's stuck, uh, set in stone. Thank you, Councillor. And yes, um, on the second point first, we've asked the inspectors if Amity Grove should be removed because since the plan started, it has now got planning permission to be a nursery and um, it is no longer owned by the NHS who are the people who put it forward in the first place. And back to your first point, yes, we're reviewing the entire plan for consistency to make sure that those issues such as referring to something that was a bit dated don't, don't come up. And those are the points of change that the inspectors have asked for and that we'll recommend to them to be done before the consultation starts. Can I just add a uh, similar point on that? Things, things like site W12, um, has already been built up and um, W15 and YMCA is like equally but that, that's well on the way to being built and potentially a few of the others that I'm looking at on the map so yeah it'd be good if they sort of dropped and disappeared out entirely because all that does is pump too many people who ask why is it there is something else new planned but the answer will be no because it's already built and if I think of it see any more I'll let you know but they, they, there's two that come to mind Thank you, Councillor. Where sites are still under construction, albeit like YMCA is substantially under construction, um, we tend to leave them in the plan in case there is a revision to applications. It's not unheard of, especially with a bigger scheme or a more complex scheme for applicants to come back during construction and want to revise matters. And it is useful for the planning committee to have that's the site allocation in place at the time. Um, so unless the site is completely finished, we haven't asked the inspectors to remove it. Um, that is also the case for the AFC Wimbledon site that finished during, well, quite recently, actually, during the course of the local plan. And although the planning permission was granted and, and construction was substantially complete during the lifetime of the plan, there are still elements such as the retail at the front, which haven't quite been finished off. So hence, it's still in the plan to, to make sure that should that come to planning committee, they have a, an allocation for it.
got a question to ask about the um, estates part of it that you talked about. Obviously, I represent a ward that's got Ravensbury Grove in it. So what are the um, implications with that? I mean, are the plans going to be changed there or is it? Because what I'm thinking, obviously, the, the, the plans were changed once before, weren't they, when Ravensbury garages came into the equation. So I'm just wondering what, what the plans for Ravensbury Grove are. Thank you, Councillor. Ravensbury Estate was part of the Estates Local Plan 2018, but since that happened, it's also the whole estate has got full planning permission now across, I think it was four phases. So in a sense, there is no more planning permission to be granted unless there are small changes during the construction of the phases. So if you like, they're unlike High Path and Eastfields, which don't have planning permission for the last parts. Ravensbury has got planning permission granted and Clarion is under construction for phase two, having built phase one on the garage site, I think about three years ago, maybe two years ago. I think it finished during the, the pandemic, I recall. Um, I can send you the details of the particular planning permissions, but they, unless Clarion are proposing a revision and they're not proposing a substantial revision as far as we know. Those will simply just go through construction over time. Yes, that, I mean, that would be good if you could send me the, the documents because I've, I've not, obviously I wasn't the councillor then, so that would be great, thanks. Councillors, does anyone have any more questions or should we move on to the final item? Thank you, councillors. The final item will come back to you um, in the spring. This is relating to a planning rule called an Article 4 direction, which is proposed to apply to certain places in Merton to stop, no, to require houses and multiple, to require homes to seek planning permission if they want to change into a house in multiple occupation. So forgive me for using a lot of planning speak there. I'll, I'll talk through the report. Um, Government allows things to take place without planning permission. It's called permitted development, and it allows things like house extensions. Uh, it allows shops to change into flats. It, they allow apartments on top of existing blocks of apartments. There's lots of changes you can make without having to come to the council to seek planning permission. And councils have a limited power to stop that permitted development. Government don't particularly like not to, to change it to make it require planning permission. Government are clear that they don't like councils stopping permitted development and they do intervene quite a lot to stop it happening. But there are cases where councils can gather evidence together and demonstrate that in the well for the well-being of the local community in this particular area, ideally the smallest area possible certain permitted development rights must stop and if a landowner wants to do something they must come to the council so in the particular case we're talking about here there's a type of development known as a housing multiple occupation and essentially that's a house or a flat that's occupied by a group of people that aren't necessarily living as a household so for example they might be renting one room rather than the whole uh, house or flat they might have completely locks on the doors, their own doors. They will have meals at different times. They will have different tenancies and they will be living as a group of people who are, in a sense, not a household, unrelated to each other, very transactional arrangements. I suppose a bit like a hostel. That's known as a house in multiple occupation. And for big houses in multiple occupation, you already need to get planning permission. If seven or more people are living there, you need to come to the council and ask for planning permission to change a normal home into one of these houses of multiple occupation. What this report is proposing is to introduce restrictions on that to mean that 
small houses of multiple occupation now have to seek planning permission from the council before they start. This is because there are some parts of the borough and the best way of looking at this is probably the map on page, page is this, page 14 of the pack, which shows details analysis con uh, conducted by a company called Meta Street, which looks at houses of multiple occupation that have caused problems in Merton in the last five to six years. It's not all houses of multiple occupation, it just identifies the problem ones. And as you can see, there are some wards that have lots more problem houses of multiple occupation than others. So the council's looking at this holistically. We're not just using our planning powers, we're using our housing licensing powers. Um, at the moment, if you want to be a landlord, you have to have a license. But what we're proposing to do is introduce additional licensing requirements for these types of properties. As it touches on this in the report, but this is really a separate from the planning process, so I'm not going to focus too much on this for this committee. And we are proposing to introduce an Article 4 direction to mean that anyone who wants to turn a normal house or flat into a house of multiple occupation has to come to submit a planning application and allow the council to consider whether that's appropriate for that particular development. Yes, pause there if any councillors have any questions so far. Um, is the proposed Article 4 area that this is due to cover, how big is that compared to any other existing Article 4 areas that exist in Wimbledon, such as Wimbledon Town Centre and the Merton Park Hedges one, which is, I always found quite unusual how we managed to get one for Hedges. The proposed Article 4 direction covers seven wards. Um, Cricket Green, Collier's Woods, Graveney, Figs Marsh, Longthornton, Lavender Fields, and Pollard's Hill. Um, and that's been selected because those are the wards with the highest number of problem houses and multiple occupation that we have at the moment. And again, as I mentioned, governments are really clear that they want, that they state that we must look at the smallest geographical area possible. For the other Article 4 directions you refer to, Councillor, um, they prevent the conversion, uh, one prevents the conversion of offices into flats. And that applied to Wimbledon Town Centre and to the industrial estates. I will say, Councillor, that when we first asked the Secretary of State for that, we asked for the whole of Wimbledon Town Centre and all of the main industrial estates to be covered. And the Secretary of State sent us back uh, instruction sometime later saying, no, no, you must cut out all the offices where they already have prior approval or all the offices where the council has had an inquiry that could lead to a home being built. So that unfortunately reduced the area. And now we do have a few office buildings that have been converted to flats in Willow Lane and up at Weir Road, which have caused problems both for those occupiers and for um, local businesses as well. So in answer to your question, the size will vary. What we're asking the Secretary of State for is to cover all of the wards because of it's very difficult to cut out each individual flat and it would be hard for people to understand what we've done. The Secretary of State has the power to intervene, so we hope that they won't intervene in this case. Oops, there's a bit All right. There are there are two broad brush things here that I thought I knew, but I don't. Um what is the definition of a small home? Where the, the house is square cubic meters, or does it go by bedrooms or, did, or whatever? Thank you. I'm just trying to find where I've written it down so that I can refer councillors to the paragraph as well. But it goes by the number of occupants. Um, so rather than number of bedrooms or size, because how we use homes can be different. So, so in the case of a housing multiple occupation, it's not uncommon for people to use what would normally be the living room as a, a bedroom. So it is between two and I 
think it is six people. Um, oh, sorry, three and six people. Uh, but importantly, they must be living in separate households. So if it was, it's not a three or six person family or a three or six person uh, group of people who've rented the property as one tenancy and are living and sharing milk and sharing meals and don't have locks on the door. It's people that are occupying the property in a kind of unrelated way. They happen to be in that address, but they often have locks on the doors. If someone leaves, the other tenants are not liable for that room. Um, they're not sharing meals necessarily. And it, it is in enforcement cases, it can be a fine balance. But for the purposes of planning, it's between three and six people occupying a, a property. When, I mean, this, I've given pre-planning appeals to both my neighbours, but where does building regulations stand in that? If, for instance, you can have, say, a, a three or four metre back extension and you want to put in the shower room and the toilet, does that need to go through planning regs? If it is under permitted development, then no, but it will always need building regulations. But it's easy to think of building regulations as keeping the structure safe. It kind of doesn't really mind about the neighbours or what it looks like, but building regulations to make sure the structure is safe and fire protected. So even if you don't need planning permission, you will need building regulations approval. I was thinking about some, some people put in an extra bathroom and so on or things like that and they have to use the main sewer. And sometimes they block somebody else's, that, that sort of thing. That, would that come under it? You know, need, need water supply as well. Uh, and it must be taken away. I mean, everything goes through the sewers into um, a combined one in the road. Yes. That's, that's correct, councillor. For something like that, you need Thames water permission as well as building regulations. So if someone is um, putting a new connection to the sewer, either by doing an extension or something like that, then they will need Thames water's permission. And we have had cases in parts of the borough where people have um, put extensions up without getting the necessary permissions from Thames water or building control and covered over parts of the access to the sewer, which has been a problem. But yes, definitely would need Thames Water permission if there's extra infrastructure going into the network. But that's separate from Article 4 and separate from planning. Um, in regards to like how you know if people are sharing the milk, as you say, that probably comes down to enforcement rather than why we're here, which is the planning. Um, but I, I was going to hark back a bit to the first agenda item, which was... Um, what I was going to say at September committee was to recommend that the Article 4 direction only be taken on the, the four wards that were the worst performing rather than seven. I see that that has been chosen as the criteria for the selective licensing. Um, and I think that's because, you know, things like Lavender Fields, um, which were further down the list have been included, even though, for example, if you take the worst performing HMOs, Wimbledon Town and Dundonald were ahead of that. And I just, I do wonder, since this wasn't rescheduled in September, has, has the, what was the decision making choice to go with seven uh, straight away with Article 4 rather than fewer? That's, that's a good question. Um... We used the Meta Street data, as you can see in the report, as a background, but we also used issues such as the number of complaints that have been received, um, especially from neighbours, things like that, the amount of enforcement action, the activity in our existing licensing uh, team, because we do have a, as I mentioned, you, under the Housing Act, you still need a licence for certain sizes of houses and multiple occupation. So the recommendation to cabinet was written to include seven wards. The article four starts at the start of the consultation, but if the council wants to continue it beyond the next six months, it will need to be a decision of full council. So that will come back to this committee. It will go to cabinet and it will go on to full council probably next April um, to see if the council wants to continue with the article four across these seven wards. There's a few things that could happen. One is 
the consultation started today and it will run till the end of January and we will get responses from landlords, from residents, from tenants that will influence the council's decision. And the other thing is the Secretary of State could intervene. And they don't usually with something this locally specific, which doesn't actually increase or decrease the number of homes in the borough. They might, but they, they don't usually in looking at what's happened with other councils. And that information will be presented, uh, the Secretary of State's feedback and all everyone else's feedback to councillors in the committee cycle between March and April. And it may influence whether or not it, this stays with seven wards or whether this changes to fewer or more. Uh, so further to that, sorry. I, 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 I suppose for me, I'm like last night at full council, we heard about the demands on, on planning. And it's great that you're clearing over 70% of minor applications, but would these HMOs be classed as minor applications? Uh, and because uh, I suppose my, my question is, is it that from today, if you want to have a three person HMO in Figs Marsh, you need to apply for planning permission? And is the is the planning team up to the extra work? It will be classed as a, in answer to your first question, it will be classed as a change of use. Um, it sounds a bit odd, but uh, home is classed as one particular use and uh, hostel type housing multiple occupation is classed as a different use. So even if the physical character the fabric of the building does not change at all, it's still classed as a different use. And yes, that's something the planning team has looked at. I think um, what will what this next six month periods will explore is whether there are unexpected issues such as extra enforcements that might be required. I would also say to councillors that this doesn't apply retrospectively. So if there is a housing multiple occupation that's occupied today, no one can knock on the door and say, right, you have to get planning permission for what you've already been doing. It only applies to new ones. And there is a school of thought that there's not going to be masses and masses of, of new small houses and multiple occupation. We're much more likely to see the larger ones come forward to already require planning permission. So we, we don't estimate a huge tide of work coming through, but it is something that we're working very closely with our development management colleagues to make sure that they're resourced to, to do this. And should the council take this further beyond the next six months, we will prepare planning guidance with your help to inform what officers and councillors and, and res, um, um, people developing HMOs might want to do as good practice. Oh, Tara, thanks for all your help here. Um, when we finish um, agenda item five, I mean, I'm a bit of a slow learner at times. I was scrolling further down there's another agenda item five. What's that update on selective additional licensing? Are we going on to that as well? And I was just a bit confused why that's called agenda item five as well. Maybe I missed something here. Maybe for later. Does that make sense what I'm saying? It makes perfect sense. Yes. I've just noticed what's happened. In the report, you have the, the first agenda item five, which is on page, um, I will just get that for you, on page, there we go, on page 11 of the pack, it attaches the cabinet report. So the, uh, in October, Cabinet made this decision about Article 4 direction, and there's much more information about selective licensing in there. So although it's not particularly relevant to this committee, it might be of interest to councillors. So as part of this, what we did was we wrote a short report for the borough plan panel, and we attached the Cabinet report as an appendix. Now, unfortunately, it appears that the Cabinet report was Agenda Item 5 in the Cabinet back in October, so that wording has carried across. So please ignore the second one that starts cabinets because it's simply an appendix to the first report tonight for this panel. And thank you for spotting us. Sorry for being so picky.
Um, yeah, I've got one as well. What happens with um, HMOs that are actually tenanted by another borough? I mean, obviously in Ravensbury, we, we've had one recently and it wasn't even licensed and it still isn't licensed yet, but it's another borough is actually placing people in there and they're actually people that are out on, uh, have been released from prison on licence, but it's, it's they're not... They've not been placed there by Merton. So what what what's the situation there? I'm afraid I need to direct you to our housing colleagues. Um, I, I think it's fairly common practice for boroughs to place people um, in different in other boroughs, but this is not something that we would consider through the this particular committee. It would be through the council's licensing powers, the uh, housing licensing powers. I can put you in touch with um, Elliot Brunton, who heads up the housing needs team, who might be able to explain the details. Oh, right. But so those um, HMOs would still be allowed to be set up because they were um, set up by another borough then? or It doesn't matter who sets them up, whether it's an individual, whether it's a company, whether it's another council, whether it is... Um, you often have HMOs that are victim support, so domestic violence support, for example. Uh, so it doesn't matter who sets them up. Applying rules apply anyway. But um, as I mentioned with this proposal, if the if it's a small HMO, so less than six people, um, and it's already existing, then we can't require it to have applying permission. We can require it to have a license under the Housing Act to make sure that, you know, there's enough space, that there's enough um, bin storage, that there's fire safety, those kind of really important things for the tenants, but it, we couldn't make it have planning permission. If, however, it was a large HMO occupied by seven people or more, and they hadn't got planning permission, well, you're meant to have permission, so we would be able to enforce against it. So I'm not a landlord. I'm just thinking, say I decide to buy a small flat, but I'm going to rent it out. How will I know that I'm creating potentially an HMO and have to do all the, you know, <laughs> go through the planning to, to, to understand the question? Thank you. That is a good question. And I will say we get lots of inquiries. I'd say reaching us probably three or four a week about HMOs, about licensing. So there's clearly a big network uh, of landlords who are aware that different boroughs have different rules and um, that they need to reach out and work out what license they need and what um, whether they need planning permission. Now, most of this will come through the licensing route because most landlords, if they're going to rent a flat, not as one unit, but as different rooms, they, they know now that they need a license, a landlord license. In fact, even if you're renting a property as one unit, you also need a license. So they usually contact our licensing team who will be able to tell them now that if it's in a particular area, they, will, they may also need to seek planning permission. And that will potentially influence how they choose to rent the property or whether they they want to, to seek permission. So we, as part of the consultation, we're also contacting all the people on the council's existing licensing register. So anyone who has a license today is getting a message saying, this is you know, additional licensing and these um, Article 4 direction is coming. Uh, please respond to the consultation. And you know, there's information on the website about what it might mean for them. Tara, I wanted to ask, um, uh, how has the recent boundary changes, um, has it affected what we're reading here in the plan? Because you know there's been some boundary changes. And for instance, we've taken, uh, Lower Morden has uh, taken a little bit of St. Helier and that. But has uh, the boundary changes for other wards changed anything in this? You know, does that make sense? Yeah. Has that been taken into account here? Um, I don't 
think it has made a difference because I'm pretty sure that when the consultants Meta Street started this work, the boundary changes were already in place. And they had, I recall that they had the new boundaries when they were starting the work. So they were able to start from a position where they had the boundaries. And certainly they asked us at one point, can you confirm that this ward map is the latest one and that this one is an older version? So I suppose, if you like, if there had been further changes, it's simply the places with the most concentrated, worst performing HMOs. Uh, so if I'm hearing correctly, basically, because we're the borough plan committee, the selective um, licensing change to the four wards and the additional licensing scheme for the seven wards don't really come under our remit. So it was just there for our information, which is great. But the rest of the consultation, because the consultation has all three things in, is obviously about the Article 4 direction. But um, if I am clear, that's got the mayor's seal yesterday. So is that in already or is it in after this meeting or is it just like, that's it, it's done, done deal? Uh, there's two different answers to your question, Councillor, I'm afraid. For the selective and additional licensing, it's a, a process we'd all expect where the council makes a decision, it does a consultation, it takes account of the views, and then it sets up or not, or varies the proposal. Uh, for the licensing scheme, that's quite a lot of work because it involves different prices and you have to tell people how much they might be charged and what, in the case of additional licensing, what additional issues they'd have to consider in getting their license. So it's a, quite a detailed and much more cumbersome process than the Article 4 direction. In the case of the Article 4 direction, there are two types. There's a non-immediate one, which takes about 18 months, and there's an immediate one. And cabinets in October decided to put the immediate one in place. And that means that it starts on the day the consultation starts. So it starts today. And it runs for six months. And during that six month period, when the council's got feedback from the consultation, they can decide to continue or change or stop. And that's the part where a councillor is here will be influencing the decision maker as to whether to continue or change or stop. Had we had the meeting in September, there would have been more inputs to the initial decision, but actually the biggest decision is coming down next spring, whether to change or amend or stop for the Article 4 direction. Thank you. So essentially, um, it's like tonight's definitely for our information rather than for us to offer any recommendations because it seems like, for example, the consultation on, on the website um, says we're introducing the immediate article of direction, as you said, um, and um, it will be going to press today. Um, but it said that the feedback gathered will help us make a decision about these initiatives. So realistically, the decision's already made. It's just a matter of whether at council in April next year, it is given the time for, uh, you know, good scrutiny and it is decided whether that is going to continue or not. Is that correct? That's correct. We have a meeting, I think, scheduled for the end of March, which would tie in nicely with decision making in March. Um, and I can't remember when the council, the series of meetings are. But yes, that would be the, if you like, the key time, because that would set this policy in place for either a long time or amended or stopped. Thank you. Yes. So basically, we get the opportunity in March to go, we don't think this is working or we think this is great. And then that will be taken into consideration at the full council. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Does anyone have any other questions? Because that is the final. Um, item on the agenda tonight and of course you're always welcome to contact us outside the meeting if you've got particular queries that didn't come up tonight because when one borough the borough boundary i mean we've had trouble trying to stop rat runs and we want to change you know turn left only and Sutton have said no you, we don't want you to do that because half the road is in on there, the borough boundary runs down the middle of the road, and they they can't overrule us, but they can block us. Does that happen often, or is there negotiation between brother, between boroughs that takes place when this is in its process? 
on the planning issues, uh, there's I've got three parts to answer this question, Councillor. On planning issues, on the local plan, we're legally required to cooperate with each other, not just with our neighbours, but right across the country. So it doesn't get to the stage, for example, where one council decides, I don't want any waste facilities, I'm going to put them all in my neighbours' um, plans. So on the big picture scale, we have to cooperate and we will not get, and no other borough will get their plans approved unless the inspectors can see evidence that we've cooperated. On the Article 4 direction, actually Croydon already have this in place in their borough, which borders several of the boards that we're proposing. And I can't remember if Lambeth do as well, but there are about 16 boroughs in London that have a similar Article 4 direction. So we expect that actually it combines well with the wards that we've selected that Croydon identified a similar problem with houses and multiple occupation in their areas. On issues of roads and traffic, yes, that can be thorny. Uh, Transport for London controls the main roads, the red routes in London, to prevent that happening. So to prevent boroughs making different decisions on main roads that run through the capital. They're all controlled by Transport for London including, for example, the roads outside the Civic Centre, right around the Triangle. On other roads, we have had issues with our neighbours sometimes with um, one borough wanting to introduce maybe speed limits or restrictions on HGVs and moving those HGVs into the neighbouring borough, which might be us. So it is an ongoing negotiation, if you like, with our neighbours where there are restrictions put in place on a roads that we feel are having a negative effect on our residents. Are there any more questions? Well, thank you, Tara, for all your knowledge. Um, and we'll see you again in March. Is that the next one? I think so, Chair. I think it's March. OK, thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming. I hope you've learned. Uh, but I hope you've learned that's only the beginning. Um, this gets more complicated as it goes on. But see you all again in March for this for this particular panel anyway. And safe journey home. <laughs>